guest tonight is Hilton Kramer, who is the art critic of the New York Times, and more to our present point, has uh, in recent months and years uh, written extensively, and I think extraordinarily well, about the period that we're talking about here, the uh, period of uh, left-right agitations uh, afflicting Hollywood, uh, the entertainment industry, the arts in general. Uh, anyway, Hope, thank you for joining us. Uh, we've just come from this extraordinary picture of mission to Moscow. Um, is there anything that you uh, care to say just to orient us <laughs> in this discussion about mission, perhaps not as an aesthetic experience, but as a political experience? Well, it's uh, as as a, a, a film uh, artifact or a cultural artifact. Uh, the, the film is, in a sense, a kind of anti-Stalinist dream of uh, what was being perpetrated on, on behalf of all uh, Stalinist position. Uh, this uh, picture of uh, kind of uh, benign Arcadian uh, Soviet state uh, over which. <coughs> Uh, this jolly, thoughtful, sensitive uh, a ruler uh, <laughs> broods, <laughs> uh, keeping his workers and peasants happy. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's not just a, a caricature, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really a cruel travesty, uh, quite intentionally designed to cover up one of the greatest reigns of terror in the history of politics. Uh, the 30s uh, in the Soviet Union uh, were, uh, was a, a period in which S Stalin consolidated his tyranny by removing uh, the last of the Bolshevik leaders who had created the revolution with Lenin. Uh, and it was not the enemies of the state but the people who might conceivably, not necessarily actual, but might conceivably have questioned Stalin's rule, who were being systematically liquidated, both in the public trials, in which there's a, of course, a grotesquely a misleading account in the film, uh, and uh, even uh, to a much greater degree, uh, out of uh, the public view, uh, this is the period when the great uh, slave labor camps uh, begin to reach their apogee. Uh, Stalin didn't exactly create them, or the Lenin did that, but Stalin turned out to be much, much greater virtuoso at uh, making them an instrument of uh, policy. Uh, you have to read a book like Robert Conquest, The Great Terror, or a book of memoirs like Nadajda, Mendelstam's hope against hope to really conceive of, of this entire nation being held in the grip of, uh, of a, a terror night and day which nobody, no matter how far up in government, no matter how obscure, uh, lived in the terror of being liquidated or sent to a slave labor camp. Uh, more to the point, uh, in regard to the war effort, we uh, now uh, know through historical research and so on uh, that this reign of terror far from strengthening uh, Stalin's uh, and Soviet Russia's position vis-a-vis -vis Hitler actually did a great deal to uh, damage uh, the strength of the Red Army uh, because Stalin could, didn't feel he could count on the, the leadership of the Red Army to support him in his power struggle against the old Bolsheviks and so the, the Red Army was, in, in effect, the leadership of the Red Army was, in effect, dismantled also, which left Russia uh, so vulnerable to Hitler's attack when it came. So there's really nothing about this film that has any attachment to historical reality except the reality of a political position in this country at that time that wanted uh, to believe that it was so. It is, it's, uh, is it not a fact that it was well known to the liberal and socialist left that uh, all of this was going on 
uh, perhaps not in the detail that historical evidence uh, now leads us to know, but there was certainly a general opinion on the left that something like this reign of terror was going on in the Soviet Union at the time. I mean, you could find actual responses to Mission to Moscow indicating as much. Um, my question really is how, given this fact, um, how even can, let's say, uh, movie people not terribly well versed in politics, though I think perhaps the man who wrote this thing was rather well versed in politics, uh, how could they, you know, permit even, you know, permit a travesty of this kind uh, to go forward? I mean, could they have possibly been so imbued with this notion that we had to support our allies that they blinded themselves to, uh, to this kind of evidence? Well, I think uh, there, were, there were two primary reasons for it. One, uh, certainly uh, the more benign reason, had to do with the war effort. Mm -hmm. uh, under the, uh, the banner of the spirit of win the war, uh, any enemy of Hitler was automatically an ally of ours, and uh, anything that was going to uh, save American lives in this war effort was to be welcomed. Uh, and certainly a great many uh, <clears throat> politically erroneous views, to put it mildly, were espoused under that, uh, under from that general, <coughs> on that general impulse, as I'm sure other films, some other films in the series have made clear. Sure. Uh, but there was also another factor, and that uh, uh, a less benign factor, and that is that there were a lot of people, uh, a lot of intellectuals and sub-intellectuals with important positions in our culture, uh, then. Uh, before and even now, who simply cannot come to terms with the reality of, of the Soviet terror, who for whatever reasons were uh, held political beliefs uh, that were anti-democratic, that were pro-communist, that really believed in this sort of divine mission of, of uh, communist ideology. And uh, while a great many of these people uh, were so shaken by the Hitler-Stalin pact uh, and also by the trials themselves which preceded it, a great many of them were so shaken that they left the party and, in a sense, uh, resigned uh, their uh, political beliefs. Nonetheless, there was a sufficiently strong hardcore of Stalinist true believers who were able to ride out any uh, any evidence, any contradiction, uh, any atrocity, and of course the uh, the position which they found themselves in, in uh, during the war, in which suddenly the Soviet Union and the United States were, were allies in the, in the war against fascism. Uh, gave them a, a sense of, of uh, both a sense of vindication uh, and an opportunity that they, uh, to put it mildly, did not hesitate to seize, so that it was not just uh, the Soviet Union as an ally that we're uh, being persuaded to accept in this film, but an ally that, uh, if anything, represents a more uh, uh, Arcadian image of democracy all the, all even the, than the United almost States. Almost an ideal to be yeah. aspired to. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think the significance uh, of this movie, in a certain sense, uh, other than things you so really eloquently put here, um, is that uh, a few years later, or five to be exact, um, it was one of a couple of pictures that you could actually cite uh, as propagating the Stalinist line on the screen, and thus, in a certain sense, uh, vindicated, again, another kind of evil being vindicated here, the, the, the blacklist, in other words. Uh, you could say, well, at least, uh, you know, there was Mission to Moscow, there was North Star. Well, I, I think there's no question that uh, among the, uh, the Reds who were baited, there were many Reds, that is to say, some of them were outright members of the 
Communist Party, that is a card-carrying members, uh, uh, members of cells uh, who uh, su support them with their money and organization and whatever power and influence they wielded. Um, others were not. Uh, I think that the one of the um, uh, groups that is most answerable for the way the uh, Red Scare or the Witch Hunt uh, uh, evolved were these hardcore Stalinists who in denying their own beliefs, who in refusing to defend the political ideas that they had uh, invested so much of their lives and money and influence in, and refusing to stand up in public and defend those beliefs, they implicated a lot of people who actually did not hold them but who were either colleagues or were liberals of, of, a, of a slightly different cast. Are, are you saying that what might have happened in, let's say, the particular case of the Hollywood 10, of whom I believe the majority, if not all, in fact, are very conscious. That's my opinion. Subsequently, have been, you know, yeah. in the public prints and so forth, we admitted as much. Uh, are you saying that they made, uh, and not innocent, either a tactical mistake, in other words, by take, wrapping themselves in the First Amendment, which is what Tim did, uh, that they created a climate in which, since the investigators had the goods in the First Amendment, uh, that is to say, had uh, evidence that they were part of members, are you saying that this, in effect, led to further and further reaching out uh, toward more liberal-minded people on the grounds that these guys were denying it, Therefore, conceivably, yes, everybody anybody who denied it was in the same uh, was in the same kettle. Yes, I, I, I really do believe that. I I, I think to use uh, a term of more recent coinage, I think the Hollywood Ten and their friends really uh, expected to be able to stonewall it out. Really, uh, and uh, they were expecting the Supreme Court to uh, support them in the First Amendment. Claims as, as I uh, understand the, the, the history of that particular group, uh, and I don't think they really ever expected to go to jail. Uh, I think they really expected to to bluff through, uh, but they uh, they gave the the demagogues on the right a kind of ideal opportunity to smear every kind of liberal every kind of enlightened political idea sort of the, to the left of Robert Taft uh, with the same brush. Uh, and uh, we saw the same thing in the slightly later McCarthy period where uh, the refusal of, of people to really admit to beliefs that they held created a kind of smeary, ambiguous atmosphere in which everyone who denied a commitment to the communist <coughs> cause was automatically uh, judged to be guilty. Um, yeah. This is not to defend uh, McCarthy. Uh, I think there's something of a uh, disaster to a principal uh, uh, adventurer, an opportunist. Uh, but I think, it, I think it needs to be understood it was the Stalinists who gave McCarthy his opportunity. Without the Stalinists and their tactics, McCarthy, uh, the Un-American Activities Committee, and the whole kit and caboodle would have been nowhere. They, they, they were, I think, faced with one kind of delicate problem. That is to say, they did want to deny on the basis of the first This is the early one. Yeah. Later, it was taken the fifth. But uh, on the first one, they did want to deny, which I think there is some principal reason to deny the right of inquiry uh, or beliefs. Um, so in effect, what we're saying, and I tend to agree with much of what you're saying, um, what we're saying is they in effect should have set up and said, yeah, we're communists, and so what? Or make some step out in the alley or something. Because, you know, if they had done that, they would have conceded the right of the committee to make the was the principal reason to say, well, you have the right to say it, so I'm not going to say it, whether I am or not a communist. Now, in fact, I believe it's actually Howard Koch, the uh, writer of Mission 
Boy Scouts with me. He said, I am in public outside. I am not a communist. I don't have them. Uh, but I'm not going to come anywhere and, uh, and say one way or the other. I mean, I think they were in a slightly delicate position yeah. there. Do you? Well, um, I, I don't, I guess I don't really uh, find the, the, the delicacy of that position, as you put it, as important as the uh, more cynical tactic that was evolved. I agree with you. Uh, it was a very uh, cynical tactic. Uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a history to the way Stalinists dealt with their uh, uh, opponents. Uh, and the, and see that in the Could whole, the the whole of the Hollywood Ten. Well, the the whole uh, nature of the Stalinist tactic was not to address yourself to the issue, but to uh, assassinate the character and and ethics uh, and of your opponent. That is, he was in the pay of the right or uh, or some such thing, uh, and it's still tactics. In, Stalinist the world over today that you don't discuss substantive political issues. You try to demolish the character of your opponent, uh, show that he's uh, a corrupt uh, opportunist of one kind or another. I think there isn't, isn't it true? I mean, if one looks at the behavior, the performance really considered as performance of people like John Howard Lawson in the committee room, um, Lawson in particular. Uh, footage on him. It puts me in mind of Orwell's description of the Commissar, which is half gramophone, half gangster. Yeah, well, uh, uh, he, I must say, he deserved some kind of an award. Uh, <laughs> that was certainly the greatest history on it, display of the Stalinist mentality the problem this country's ever it is, produced. It's rather, rather, film. rather naked, and of course what it is, what always struck me as curious about these people was that much as they seem to want all the rest of us and left to rally to their side, there was, there was often something in their manner, in, in particular in their style and rhetoric, that was uh, really damnably off-putting, wasn't there? Uh, well, they were sort of rally you know, they, were, they, were, they were sort of commissars in the making. I mean, they, they, they found something tremendously appealing about, uh, uh, about uh, authoritarian personnel, which does not have to deal basically with ideas. Uh, but simply uh, deals with exertions of power. Uh, and, of course, they uh, themselves were manipulators of power in their own right. That is to say, there is what I, I wrote from the Times last year, referred to as the other blacklist, and that is the blacklist which preceded the well-known blacklist, and that was the, the lists, uh, no matter how formal or informally drawn up, of non-communists, or more specifically anti-communist intellectuals, technicians, actors, and so on, uh, who were discriminated against by this uh, sort of Stalinist uh, core in Hollywood, mm -hmm. uh, and of course elsewhere in publishing, and so on. Uh, and oh, it's well known, uh, they were known among other things for interviews, gaming, anti-Stalinist leftist writers. Sure. Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a it's a valuable point to make because as I, I said earlier, this this, uh, this whole business of uh, kind of making automatic heroes uh, out of these people because indeed they did suffer in some parts of Germany, lots of parts of Well, they certainly did suffer. Lots of their swimming pools and hunting branches is a small matter. Uh, I think it is perhaps fair to say that. There's a lot of culpability uh, within the rest of the society. In other words, it seems to me that heaven knows the, uh, the networks, the uh, movie studios themselves, uh, scarcely show themselves as very uh, devoted to uh, a democratic experience of uh, civil liberties or what have you. Uh, no, I think they, I think they are uh, most of the most of the are the very bad. Uh, they in many respects they trade uh, democratic values uh, as uh, easily uh, as thoughtlessly as the Stalinists would be. Uh, but 
I think, uh, in that respect, that for the Stalinists, who did have some rather larger and less benign uh, goals in mind. How much in this country, in the early 50s, do you think the description of wave of hysteria, wave of uh, terror, potential terror, actually fits the situation as we experience it? I have the feeling that that, too, is a rather ready propagandistic phrase. Uh, well, I think the term hysteria uh, for what uh, occurred in the 50s is frankly ridiculous. Uh, I uh, was uh, first in graduate school and then in various writing and magazine jobs uh, in the 50s, uh, having no particular political connections uh, of any sort. Uh, and uh, I certainly uh, didn't notice it. I also had very first-hand acquaintance with a number of people uh, who uh, had their passports held up by the State Department. Yeah. It didn't quite, though, become a, a reign of terror in, in what I think has become a too ready phrase. Uh, I thank you very much for joining us. It's, I hope, a, a rather novel and insightful discussion. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.